Good afternoon. I'm Councilman Rory Lanceman, Chair of the Committee on the Justice System, and I'm chairing this hearing examining recently established or expanded programs designed to mitigate the damage of our existing money bail system. We are joined by Council Members Debbie Rose from Staten Island and Alan Maisel from Brooklyn. Today, on Rikers Island, there are thousands of inmates who are free to walk out the door to their freedom, back to their families, their jobs, their schools, <clears throat> but only if they come up with the money to pay their bail. Our current money bail system is an abomination, and no doubt future generations will look back on it with the same disdain that today we look back on debtors' prisons and the practice of putting people in stocks. Although the legislature should abolish money bail, our district attorneys should stop seeking money bail, and our judges should cease setting money bail, city government is not without its own leverage in limiting the scope and impact of money bail. Today we will examine two such efforts, funded by city taxpayers, one specifically at the initiative of the city council. The first is the Vera Institute for Justice's bail assessment pilot, and the other is the Criminal Justice Agency's newly expanded Bail Expedition, or BEX, program. Betwe between the two, <clears throat> we are seeing huge potential for rewriting the traditional bail script. New York's current bail statute allows for nine possible forms of bail to be set, and it requires that, that bail be set with consideration of a defendant's financial circumstances. The different kinds are cash bail, a commercial bail bond, a credit or debit card, an appearance bond where the defendant promises to pay the whole of amount of the bond if they fail to return to court, or a surety bond where another person, like a friend or family member, makes the same promise on behalf of the defendant. Both appearance and surety bonds come in three types, secured, partially secured, or unsecured, which can require collateral, a small refundable deposit to the court, or some indication of ability to pay the full amount in the future like an expected paycheck, if the defendant fails to appear, but require little to no money up front to secure release. However, until recently, only two forms of bail were regularly set by the court, cash and commercial bail bond, and rarely, if ever, did anyone ask a defendant if he or she could actually pay the bail that was being set. That is why so many people spend time on Rikers Island for seemingly small amounts of bail, $500 or $1,000. For many New Yorkers, $500 might as well be $5 million. Cash and commercial bail bonds are the simplest for courts to set, but the hardest for defendants to pay. They leave defendants scrambling to pull together the full bail amount immediately to pay in cash, or relying on commercial bail bond agents who, at best, charge non-refundable fees, and at worst, take tremendous advantage of vulnerable people in need. Vera's bail assessment pilot, along with its previous efforts to increase the use of so-called alternative forms of bail, is demonstrating how a little information can go a long way. By performing a quick interview and documenting an individual's income and expenses, including housing, child care, or child support, medical bills, student loans, and basic necessities, Vera calculates how much money a defendant can afford to pay and makes an on-the-record on recommendation to the judge. More than just the amount, Vera also emphasizes the availability of so-called alternative forms of bail, like partially secured or unsecured bonds. These options require little or no money up front, allowing a defendant to avoid a life-destabilizing pretrial stint at Rikers Island, but full payment if the defendant does not return to court. Vera's results have been promising in the Bronx, where they have been operating since March, and we are excited that they have recently also launched in Queens. The BEX program has existed far longer, but it has recently taken an even larger role in bail reform efforts. The Criminal Justice Agency helps those with bail set navigate, hopes those with bail set navigate a complicated system. CJA can now hold an individual at the courthouse for up to 12 hours while trying to get in contact with friends or family who might be able to post bail before an individual is sent to Rikers and put through a long, expensive, 
an often unnecessary intake process. With the expansion of the BEX program, CJA has also increased its ability, its eligib eligibility threshold to help those with bail of up to $5,000. The data from these programs demonstrate how relatively minor interventions can significantly change outcomes for those with bail set, making defendants more likely to be released quickly, decreasing our jail population, and focusing attention on the injustices of our current cash bail system. Maintaining and expanding these important programs, building upon their successes, and learning from their collected data will help countless people while educating the public, prosecutors, and especially judges about the essential reforms we need. I look forward to hearing today from organizations and advocates devoted to working towards a new conception of bail about their efforts and how the city can help. With that, we look forward to hearing testimony from our friends from Vera and CJA. If you would raise your right hand so we can swear you in and we can get to your testimony. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Terrific. Um, you want to go first? A little, oh, there, now it's working. I turned the light on. I've never been known to be quiet, but still. Um, good afternoon, and thank you so much for this opportunity to come and speak with the council about, the, about our bail assessment work. Now, we launched this project because we were curious about th three key questions. The first was, what would judges do if they had individualized, specific information about a person's ability to afford bail when making their bail decision? The second is, what would judges do if they were provided with information about the forms of bail that a person could afford beyond cash or insurance company bail bond? And the third question we were curious about is, what impact would that have for individuals who are accused of a crime in their ability to make bail and go back to their homes, their families, and their jobs and preserve their presumption of innocence while fighting the charges against them. And so earlier this year, we launched the bail assessment pilot in the Bronx, where we've been operating for a little over six months, and then more recently in Queens. And we are in uh, the day arraignment part on Tuesdays and Thursdays in the Bronx and on Wednesdays and, thir and Fridays in Queens. And we actually started this project based on another study that we had done with the Office of Court Administration over a year ago, where we encouraged public defenders to ask for partially secured and unsecured bonds, and we trained judges on these so-called alternative, I will call them more affordable forms of bail that are easier for people to afford. And what we found in doing that study where we tracked 99 cases over the course of three months in which judges set unsecured bonds where the defendant actually didn't have to pay anything to be released. It was a promise to pay if the person didn't appear in court. Or if judges set a partially secured bond where the person was responsible for paying 10%, no more, of the bail amount, and then they were released with the understanding that if they didn't come back to court and bail was forfeited, then they would be liable for that remaining 90%. And so we followed these 99 cases for over a year to find out what happened when judges actually used these forms of bail. And to our knowledge, this was the first time that an effort had been undertaken in such a sort of uh, robust way to get judges to actually use these forms of bail, building upon the work that certainly our public defenders at the Legal Aid Society, Bronx Defenders, Brooklyn Defender Services, and other offices across the city have been working on for years to get judges to consider all nine forms of bail available under our bail statute. And here's what we found in this study is we found that when judges set unsecured and partially secured bonds, people were able to afford bail at much higher rates. And that comes as no surprise to any of us as being able to afford 10% of a bail amount or simply a promise to return to court is far less onerous for a person than having to pay the full bail amount or to go to a bail bonds company where even if you put only 10% down, that's 10% of the bail amount that your family will never see again, 10% that's essentially lost. The difference with partially secured bonds is that money is actually paid to the court, but it's returned at the end of the case, regardless of whether the person is convicted or acquitted or the case is dismissed. So that's money that's essentially a deposit, but is returned. 
And what we also found is when judges use partially secured and unsecured bonds, basically the sky didn't fall down. People return to court at the exact same rates that they do if they make the full money bail amount or a, an insurance company bail bond. And also, uh, no, there were no increases in rearrest during the pretrial period. And from our court observations during this three-month study, what we also found is that the reason why judges would consider a partially secured or an unsecured bond is when they actually had a little bit more information about the case in front of them. And so we noticed that when public defenders said, Your Honor, I've spoken with my client, and this is how much they earn in a week, and this is the two jobs that they're working, and this is how much they pay in transportation and child support, and this is how much they pay to in rent every month. That's when judges actually set these alternative forms of bail, in part because they think they were moved by the information that was specific and individualized to that particular case. And so building off of that, we launched this project in the Bronx and Queens to see if we provide that kind of individualized specific information in front of a judge every single time they are making a bail determination, what actually happens. And so I want to share a little bit of data from our first six months of operation in the Bronx. Uh, this data set includes 112 cases, and it ranges from misdemeanor to felony cases, including some violent felony cases. We have no restrictions on the kinds of cases that we will take and assess and provide this information to the court, in part because we believe that somebody's ability to afford bail doesn't change based on whether you're charged with jumping the turnstile or you're charged with something much more serious. And so this is available to anybody who is at risk of having bail set. And here's how the project works, is uh, our bail specialist sits in the front row of the courtroom, and if the defense attorney picks up a case and thinks, I think this is a case where bail is going to get set, they come and speak with our bail specialist, and she conducts an interview in the interview booths in the arraignment courtroom with the individual, with the defendant. And she asks a series of 30 questions, and we'll be submitting in our testimony uh, the bail calculator that is used to ask these questions. And they essentially ask questions about the person's sources of income from their employment, their sources of an income from public assistance, and then their financial obligations, such as rent, childcare, food, transportation, the things that you need to get by. And based on that information, we calculate a monthly disposable income that's available to this person. And from that, which proportion of uh, their disposable income should go towards bail payment. And the reason that we developed this particular calculator and this particular formula is because we firmly believe and the research suggests that when people do have to pay for an emergency, such as paying bail or for a debt, all of their disposable income should not go towards bail payment because inevitably that's coming out of money that they otherwise would spend on rent or on food or on other necessities. And so we were very careful to actually work with a social science research lab at Duke University to make sure that we were calculating a person's ability to pay appropriately so that while it certainly would still be a squeeze, especially on families in the Bronx, which is one of the poorest congressional districts in this country, it wouldn't be so much of a squeeze that bail was unaffordable for individuals as we know it currently is in our current practice. And so of those 112 cases that we um, have assessed so far, here's what we found. One sort of shocking statistic, at least to me, and I was a public defender in the Bronx, so this should actually come as no surprise, but it still really floored me, was that over 50% of the individuals that we assessed had no ability to pay. And in fact, many of them were operating in the red. And that shouldn't be surprising, again, given sort of uh, the circumstances that people in the Bronx are in and how many people are not employed or are underemployed. But still, I think that's an important statistic for the city council to hear, thinking about the future of money bail and whether or not money bail feels fair, even if it is done in an individualized and considered way. Of the folks who had no ability to pay, uh, our bail specialist asked, do you have anybody else who can make bail for you? And in cases where people said, yes, I do have somebody, here's their contact information, our bail specialist's job is to persist in getting a hold of that person before the case is called in arraignments to give that person a fighting chance to actually be able to make bail if bail is in fact set. 
And what we found is when there's somebody whose dedicated job it is to get a hold of friends and family members, we actually succeed. Um, in cases where we had a contact information for somebody, 90% of the time we were able to contact that person and see if they're able to help with bail. And so again, for the practice, and Aubrey and I have spoken about this before, for the practice of arraignments and making sure that we are getting a hold of friends and family members who can help with bail, I think this is a really important finding for us. Now, of folks who had some ability to pay, another statistic that really floored me was um, how little bail people can afford even when they have some ability to pay. And so in the cases where we did assess people as having some ability to pay bail, by and large, we actually assessed the person as being able to afford a partially secured bail because they had a little bit of money right now, but they would have money coming in, usually through a job uh, that they would get a paycheck in two, three weeks, and therefore they could pay 10% now and would be on the hook for that other 90%, but if the judge set that full bail amount, that would be beyond what they could afford in that moment at arraignments. And so what we found on cases where we assessed the person as being able to afford a partially secured bond, the range was from $50 partially secured bond to $8,000 partially secured bond, meaning there was somebody who had $5 available to them now and did have the other $45 they could get that over the course of a couple of months. But if the judge actually set $50 cash bail, which is an absurdly low amount for judges to set, mind you, but even if they did, that would be too much bail for this particular, indiv for this particular individual, which is why we recommended $50 partially secured bond. On the other hand, there was a family that was in court and they did have $800 available to them and also had income coming in and they could afford a, a greater amount. And on a particular case, uh, which happened to be a very serious B felony charge, uh, the assessment was that this person and their family members could afford an $8,000 partially secured surety bond. So again, that shows the range of the different kinds of recommendations that we're making to the court in doing this assessment. Now, what impact does it have on judges to actually hear both the amount of bail that somebody can afford as well as the forms of bail they can afford? What we found is in the cases where we did an assessment and we provided that information on the record, in almost a third of those cases, judges in the Bronx set a partially secured option. And for those of you who have been in the Bronx courtrooms for a number of years, you know that that's a very recent phenomenon. And I do attribute it to the incredible advocacy from the defender community in the Bronx who have really taken up this program and used it um, relentlessly when we are there on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And it also speaks to the willingness of the bench in the Bronx to actually hear new information and do arraignments in a different way. Before we started the program in the Bronx in April, we actually trained all of the criminal court judges, and it's a fairly new bench there, and they were wonderfully open and willing and asked great questions about how does this calculator work? What am I supposed to do with this information? What if I set bail at an amount higher than what the calculator assesses? They had very good questions for us about what does this mean for their own practice as judges. And we really are grateful for the partnership of the Office of Court Administration as well as the supervising judges in the Bronx and Queens for helping us to launch this project in the ways that it has been for the past couple of months and we hope to continue and to expand and really build upon the foundation that we have laid. Finally, of those cases where partially secured bond options are set, what we know is that it gives people a fighting chance to actually make bail. In cases where a partially secured bond option was set in the pilot, 86% of individuals made bail, which is a pretty remarkable statistic compared to citywide, otherwise the ability of people to make bail when cash bail or insurance company bail bond is set. And we actually have a comparison number for you in our sample, which is of the cases where individuals were only given a bail option that was cash or insurance company bail bond, the more traditional options, 57% made bail compared to 86%. And so that really tells us that we are on to something. As long as we have a money bail system providing, <coughs> excuse me, this kind of individualized information and making that become part of the bail record is incredibly important to New Yorkers and the ability to actually afford bail and to be at liberty pretrial. 
Now, we are following all of the cases that we have assessed throughout the pendency um, of those cases to be able to say something about court appearance as well as uh, case disposition and pretrial rearrest, all factors that we know are really important to the functioning of our justice system as well as information that the city council cares about and I think is really instructive to these forms of bail and how they're used. And I'll stop with just three, three points that I would like the council to consider in where do we go from here. For one, I think that we, we know now from the data that this is something that works. It moves judges. It moves the culture of the courtroom in terms of bail and how bail is used. And it's something that we should figure out as a city, um, as long as we have a money bail system, how do we make sure that every single bail decision is made only after a judge has the ability to consider a person's financial circumstances and the forms of bail that are most appropriate for this person. The second thing is how to make sure that judges and public defenders as well as uh, district attorneys are familiar with all of the forms of bail and that they are open and receptive to its use. It's been in our bail statute since 1971, but we know that it's only in very recent years that there's been any traction at all. And we've made some headway, but there's a lot of headway left to be made. And so the city council should invest in that training, in oversight and accountability to make sure that uh, judges have to consider these forms of bail and that it's part of the routine practice of bail decisions in the courtroom. And then finally, I want to go back to the statistic that I raised about 86% of people being able to afford bail when a partially secured option was given. That's still 14% of New Yorkers where, in theory, a judge set a partially secured bond because they wanted this person to make bail, right? Otherwise, they might have defaulted to what they usually do, which is set a cash or an insurance company bail bond option. Yet that's still 14% of New Yorkers who, given that opportunity for a more affordable form of bail, couldn't actually make it, which I think, again, goes to the question of how much utility and how much fairness can we truly get out of a cash bail system. Thank you. Before we move to Beck, I just want to just get the numbers right on, on your program. And council so, member, we'll be submitting those numbers to you. We've shared them with your council, so okay. we do have them, but yeah. Thank you, thank you. So um, there were 133 assessments, 133 defendants that you assisted? Yes. Okay. And so higher now. 70% of them had bail set. Yes. So in 133 cases, you said to the judge, listen, this is what this person can afford, or this is a mechanism that they could meet. So in 70% of the cases, some form of bail was set. The other 30% were released on their own recognizance, or there was a supervised release. Yes. OK. Of the 70% that were where bail was set, <clears throat> 30% of those were partially secured bond? Yes. While insurance company bond and cash, parentheses, 55%, was the most combina common combination of bail set. I, I, just explain that, that math for me. I don't understand. Sure. sure, it doesn't add up to 100. Right. So the remainder was uh, where judges set insurance company bail bond, cash bail, and credit card bail. Got it. So of the... Of the 70%, 30% um, of those had partially secured. Yeah. The other 70% had some combination or s of either cash, which might have been cash that you set. Full amount, right? right? Yeah. But based on your recommendation, right? Yes, although the, the number of cases in which judges set exactly the amount and the form assessed is low. Of this sample, uh, it was five cases in total where judges set bail at the exact amount assessed and in the form of bail. One of the fascinating things we have found here is that we are seeing judges agree more to set partially secured bonds. We have not yet, I, I would say, broken the barrier of judges setting lower amounts of bail. Um, in a handful of cases, judges have been willing to do that, but what we are seeing in our hunch, and we're looking at this in the data, is that judges might be setting a lower amount of bail than they originally would have set. So instead of, say, a $1,000 bail, maybe they're willing to set 750 or 500 
But what they are willing to do as a concession, if you will, to hearing this information is to set a partially secure adoption. And our hunch is that of the 86% of folks who are able to afford a partially secured bond, they're stretching more than our assessment uh, would suggest or recommend, um, but they are in fact being able to make that form of bail. One thing I also want to clarify, Council Member, is of the cases um, where we did an assessment, there are a handful of cases where we actually did not go on the record or that information wasn't given to the judge because it was clear from the arraignment proceeding that the judge was going to release that person. And so there is uh, that what you always have to account for given that we have defense attorneys being the gatekeeper is there might be a defense attorney who believe this is a case where bail might get set when in fact bail wasn't set. And if it looks like the case will be ROR'd, we certainly won't, won't inject, you know, in, interject with, with information if not necessary. Got it. So, what's this? Mm. More than two-thirds of the participants in bail set cases were able to subsequently post the bail. Yeah. So the other third, even with whatever the court was willing to do, they couldn't meet that, right? And, and why not, since you were recommending to the judge something that the defendant could meet? Are those the, th the third of the cases where the judge said, I don't care what you say? Yes. There's a, a significant number of cases in which judges set higher bail than what was assessed. And certainly that third falls into that category. Right. I, I know we're just getting into to the, yeah. to the meat of it. Sorry, just indulge us. So why, what were the reasons or the rationales that either were expressed or you mm -hmm. could, we you could know, observe. observe or infer for why the judge would say, too bad? I don't want to pine just yet because we're sort of in the process of sorting through the data, but I wonder if the cases where judges were more likely to set bail higher than the assessed amount have to do with charges or with prior histories, right? And we're collecting that data for each and every case, um, prior convictions, prior failures to appear, current charge. And my hunch is that if we look at more serious charges at felony cases, that's where judges are perhaps less likely to go along entirely with the assessed amount. And so, you know, you talked about, and this is very important and, and frankly, uh, a motivation behind the council funding this program. You talked about moving the culture of, of, of the courtroom mm -hmm. and getting judges away from using money bail as either a form of, of punishment or, or a form of preventive pretrial yep. detention for, for, for its own sake. Yep. Um, is, is that mindset being moved? And, and, and I know you said that the data will be forthcoming and, and you've got to do your own analysis and more time has to spool out. Yep. But um, at least with those cases where, mm -hmm. where the judges were open to uh, and, and did set bail according to your recommendations. Is that culture changing? It is, and what we're seeing is we're tracking cases by judge, and there are judges who are setting partially secured options uh, because that's what the assessment suggests, and also on days where we are not in the courtroom, we're hearing those judges are actually setting partially secured bonds even when there is no VERA assessment being put on the record. That to me is actually huge culture change. Um, it is giving people a chance to post bail in forms that they never had a chance to even just two, three years ago. So that part of the culture change is truly happening in the Bronx, and it's not just one or two judges, but in fact several judges. I think there's a lot more work to be done to sort of keep that pressure and that feedback loop on judges to actually show here's what happens when you sort of go beyond traditional bail practices and use these alternative forms of bail. The other piece of culture change that is almost, I would say, as important as the judges is the defense bar. And in the Bronx, we have seen the defense bar just really take this on wholesale in a way that Queens, because Queens is a different courtroom, it has a different culture, it has definitely been uh, more of a lift. And so, again, what, what would address that? I think it is much more oversight, much more training, much more accountability. We're certainly talking with our 
uh, colleagues on the defense bar, advocates. Um, so how can that pressure be applied from all places? We're certainly doing it from within the courts, but where can there be pressure elsewhere so, as well? So the, the courtroom culture is influenced by the defense, the district attorneys, the, the judges, maybe the court officers. Sure. Mm -hmm. Is y you would focus, you would you would mention the defense in, in Queens. Are you are you or is this project not being embraced by legal aid and Queens Law Associates and whatever private attorneys show up? Um, it's being embraced in 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 that they um, invited us in to come do trainings. We've shared materials. The sort of the uptake has not been quite as robust as in the Bronx, and I think there are a lot of reasons for that. One is, and Aubrey and I spoke about this very recently, is uh, CJA's supervised release program it has been longstanding in Queens and I think has a lot of trust. Uh, Queens is, I would say, and I say this with some love, uh, that was the very first courtroom I ever practiced in as a student attorney. Um, it's, it's a little provincial and people do what they know and are comfortable with and so we're speaking more with CJA to figure out how can we use their credibility in Queens to help this become part of the drinking water as much as supervised releases there. Mm -hmm. and, and then culturally, well, let me just ask you directly. Are you satisfied with the cooperation that you're getting from the district attorney in the Bronx and in Queens? Are you satisfied with the cooperation that you're getting from the, the judiciary in the Bronx and in Queens? Uh, as to the district attorneys, yes. We um, spoke with both the Bronx DA's office as well as the Queens DA's office in launching, and we haven't gotten any pushback or anything that causes any concern. With the judges, um, it's this program has been up and running for longer in the Bronx, and we are really grateful for how much they've let us try this out and, in fact, have it become part of the culture, um, at least in the days that we're there. I think there's more work to be done in Queens, and we're working with Judge Johnson, the supervising judge, um, to make sure that, again, in six months, we see ourselves in a place that we are in the Bronx. Yeah. And I want to ask you about the particular concern that the defense community had, a valid concern, I, I understand it, that um, your presence and the availability of reduced bail in some shape or form might actually induce the court to set bail more often because, yep, well, because we're available, yeah, right? And right. There's, there's that information. There's always that sort of option. Um, so we, we worked very closely with the defense bar to come up with the defense attorneys as gatekeeper model, which is the model of supervised release as well, and we think that is working effectively, although I would love for you to pose that question to our friends from the defense bar who will be testifying after us. Um, I think that is one really important safeguard, and we are not sort of picking and choosing cases or um, sort of suggesting to the defense attorneys, hey, do you have this case, this particular charge, or whatever? We're just not doing that in part because we really do want to respect um, the autonomy of the defense bar and which cases come to us. That said, we might try and be a little bit more proactive so that there aren't cases that we're missing or that defense attorneys don't get to ignore us or forget about us. So that's a that's a it's a difficult balance um, and one that I don't think we have figured out just yet. Um, the, other, the other thing, though, is one of the concerns was what if somebody actually has a pretty uh, high ability to pay and is, has a lot of resources? How do we make sure that we're not making an assessment of their ability to pay that is above what a judge would set on that particular kind of case? That's a very real concern as well. And so what we did to make sure that that wouldn't happen is we actually did an analysis of uh, the bail setting on by charge um, based on Department of Correction data for both the Bronx and Queens. And we created essentially a range of we know that on, for example, turnstile jumps, uh, the sort of 75% of bails in the Bronx are set at 1,000 or less. And we decided that third quartile sort of cutoff would be our cutoff based on charge so that 
just because somebody could afford, say, $4,000 partially secured bond on a turnstile jump, that we wouldn't make that assessment um, because we don't want to have the unintended consequence of inflating bail amounts um, or actually sort of changing the culture in a way that we don't intend to change it. I will say happily that I don't think that we've needed to pull out that maximum bail chart that we created ever in the Bronx because it really speaks to how little uh, in the way of resources people who are coming through the Bronx have. I have the feeling we'll be using that chart a little bit more often or consulting with it in Queens where we've seen in the cases that we've assessed there just more range uh, and availability of resources to defendants who are charged there. Last one, what's, what's the lowest cash bail that you have recommended and has been set? Uh, cash or partially secured bond? Both. Uh, I don't know what the lowest cash bail is because we don't recommend it often. People don't have that much cash. Um, uh, the lowest partially secured bond is $50. The person had $5 in their pocket. And that person went home? We don't, I don't actually know if that person was able to make bail, but I can pull that out and uh, I'll let you know. If not, if not, that really says that person something, right? That went to Rikers Island for $5. Yeah. So here's the thing is that was our assessment. In that case, I don't believe the judge set bail at that amount and in the form of bail. I'll look it up, though, and I'll, I'll let you know. I, yeah, I'd love to know what the lowest amount is. Okay. Of, of what judges set in terms of yeah, bail amounts? Yeah, and that someone made. And what the lowest that was set and what wasn't made. I will look that up and I will get back to you. Great. Okay. Great. Sorry. It's okay. Um, so first, thanks to the council for the opportunity to talk about my agency's bail expediting program and for your support of our program. Um, so I work at the New York City Criminal Justice Agency. I think you're familiar with what we do, but we have staff who work 24-7 in each of uh, the city's five main courthouse buildings and two community courts, and we provide a, a range of pretrial services um, to defendants. Everything from uh, we interview nearly every arrestee before they see a judge, we make release recommendations to the judge and try to promote uh, release on recognizance. Um, we are the agency that's responsible for notifying every defendant of their upcoming court date um, to try to keep New York City's already very high court appearance rates, um, as high as they can be. Um, we do a lot of research and data collection. I'm gonna share some of that data with you today. And then we operate this bail expediting program, which as Chair Lansman pointed out, now works with uh, defendants who receive bail of $5,000 uh, or less. So um, I wanted to make kind of five main points uh, here. Um, and there's more detail in the, the written testimony, but I wanted to draw out what I saw as some of the, the highlights that you might find interesting. Um, we have been in a, operating since 1977 as an agency, and our goal since our founding has really been to try to reduce the use of money uh, in making pretrial decisions. And so one thing, that, one thing that I think is really remarkable is if, if you look back either a few years or a few decades, um, and I would describe this as a piece of encouraging context, bail is actually used far less often than it was in the past. So even if you compare, say, to 2013, in 2013, for a case that was continued in arraignment, meaning the defendant was arrested and they had their first court appearance in arraignment, um, judges set bail a total of 52,000 times in 2013, but as of mid-December, we're looking at judges setting bail only about 30,000 times uh, in 2018. So that's about a 40% reduction in the use of bail, um, which is a significant drop in, in this six-year period. Yeah, but there have been fewer arraignments, no? So a big part of that drop is the fact that the number of cases coming into so the what, system. What percentage of cases are judges setting bail, and how does that compare between yeah. 2013 and 2018? Great question. So there's been a 30% drop in continued cases. So that is the largest contributor to that drop in total bail set. However, as a percentage of cases continued at arraignment, bail was imposed, has been imposed 23% of the time in 2018 versus 30% of the time in 2013. And what has taken its place is greater use of release and recognizance uh, and supervised release. 
And so uh, what you find this year, which I think is really remarkable, is that for the first time since we've started gathering this data, and I would imagine um, perhaps the first time in New York City history, you're three times more likely to get a release on recognizance at arraignment than you are to receive a sentence of bail. Um, so New York City really does stand out as a, as a city that relies far more on a release on recognizance. It does not require you to pay bail to secure your release uh, than any other city in the country. Um, and I think that there are a lot of reasons why that's true, but I, it is important to point out, I think, that um, bail is being used much less frequently in the system. So a little bit about our program. As, as Chair Lanceman pointed out, um, we work with uh, defendants citywide who have bail set at $5,000 or less. And just in terms of the big picture, um, and I think this could be described as, in a, one sense, discouraging news, but also in another sense, slightly encouraging news. If you look at the percentage of people who have bail set at $5,000 or less, how many, how many of them pay bail at arraignment? How many of them are able to pay bail and get out before they're ever transported to a jail facility? Um, and we've seen that proportion uh, increase since 2014 to what it is this year, 16%. So if you get bail set of $5,000 or less citywide, 16% of those defendants are able to pay bail at arraignment and never set foot uh, in a jail facility. So that speaks. That, that was for what, 2017? That's, that's for this year. I'm giving you 18. year to date figures. That's up from 11% in 2014 and 13% in 2016. So I think how you view that statistic depends very much on um, your perspective. I think it speaks to the fact that, as Insha pointed out, people have real difficulties paying bail. So to have 16, only 16% 16 of people able to pay bail of 5,000 or less at arraignments, I think shows how difficult it is for people to pay bail immediately. But we are seeing increases um, from as recently as 2014, and keep in mind that if about 15,000 people a year are getting bail set of 5,000 or less, a one percentage point increase means 150 more people paying bail at arraignment and being allowed to go home without ever having to set foot in a jail for that case. Um, so it depends on your perspective, um, but I think it, it's a kind of dose of realism about how difficult it is to uh, have people pay bail, even small amounts of bail at arraignment, but also how we have been able to make improvements through things like investments in Bex and uh, Inch's excellent program. So uh, another point just to kind of echo something that Incha said is if you kind of dig into the dynamics of what drives someone's ability to pay bail at arraignments, a lot of it really does have to do with whether or not they have someone uh, a contact they can provide, a surety who can pay bail on their behalf. Um, and as with Inch's program, what we do is, if they provide us with the name of a contact, we work very hard to get in touch with that person and help them uh, come in and pay the bail. And uh, if you look at some of the detailed information about how our program operates and boil it down to um, what appears to be driving most of bail payments, essentially um, about half of people who are able to give us the name of a surety, in other words, someone who can come in and pay their bail, um, pay their bail either at arraignment or within two days. And only about a quarter of people are able to do so if they don't give us the name of a surety, a contact person that they can call. So I think that underlines the importance of not just people being able to identify a surety, but some sort of resource, whether it's uh, Vera or the criminal justice agency trying to reach out to that person and walk them through this often complicated process of paying bail. Um, and we have a lot of examples of kind of the individualized attention that we, we pay to sureties, that that makes the difference between their ability to pay bail on behalf of a uh, family member or a friend versus not pay bail. Um, I also wanted to speak about this unique power that CJ has, um, which is the power to issue a hold on a defendant. Um, 
And so CJ is the agency that has the authority to place a hold with the Department of Corrections that would prevent the defendant from being transported to a local jail. Um, and firstly, I wanted to say that Local Law 124 that was passed last year has been enormously helpful to us. Um, and it's helpful to us because we've seen real changes on the ground in the boroughs as a result of that legislation being passed. The first and most obvious change is that we have more time um, to work with uh, defendant's surety to allow for payment of bail. And what that means is that even when we don't ask for an extended hold, um, in each borough that we operate in, the hold time at a minimum is four hours, where in the past it might have been two or three hours. In Manhattan, it's six hours. Um, and so um, that allows us to uh, have more options to work with defendants because often we might call a surety and they would say, I need more time to get um, my, uh, to get money um, or to be able to come to the courthouse. And so that has been tremendously helpful. Um, and we've seen in our own statistics, we, we carefully check the number of times we issue a hold um, with Department of Corrections and whether or not when we issue a hold, the defendant is able, or defendant surety is able to pay and the defendant is able to go home um, before being transported to uh, jail. Roughly speaking, we, we, have, we issue about 2,000 holds a year. That, that number, that raw number has stayed the same even as the number of bailed cases has gone down significantly. And about 70% of the time, when we issue a hold, the defendant is able to pay their bail, our defendant surety is able to pay their bail at arraignment. Um, we, we do not know, we cannot track what happens for those 30% of instances where a hold did not result in bail being paid uh, at arraignment. It could either be, and most often is because despite the surety's um, pledge to come, they're not able to make it in the amount of time that is given to them. There are a handful of cases where it may have been the results, the, the lack of successful bail payment at arraignment may have been the result of a miscommunication with the Department of Corrections, but my sense is that that really is a small number. Uh, and so getting back to the importance of Local Law 124, what we've seen is since its passage um, that this year we're on track to issue more holds and to have a slightly higher hold success rate than we did last year. Um, and because as I started by saying, there are so many fewer cases in which bail is being set, the fact that we're issuing the same number of holds I think is really a, uh, a, a testament to the fact that we have much more power to issue holds than we did in the past. Um, so just a few points of where we plan to go in the future with the program. Um, we, we now collect data in a much more uh, real-time basis, and so there's a perhaps somewhat bewildering at first flowchart in the back that describes some of the really detailed data that we capture about every stage of the bail payment process and how effectively we are, are able to operate. Um, and it helps us because it allows us to identify um, potential bottlenecks and things that we're not doing accurately. So for example, um, we, we collect sureties from defendants through either the pretrial interview or a post arraignment second interview. And we wanna make sure that every time we collect a surety, we have a member of staff call that surety. And we do so about 90% of the time and um, we know we can do better than that. Um, we are also working with the city on an expansion of the BEX program, which would allow us to serve all defendants age 16 and 17, regardless of bail amount. Um, so uh, we think that would be an uh, important uh, expansion of our program and, and opportunity for the city. So I think I'll stop there, but just I wanted to again thank you for the opportunity to testify and I'm happy to an answer any questions that you might have. All right, let me just go back to uh, Vera for a minute and then I want to talk about Bex. Um, I don't know if I saw, if I'm missing it, but do you have any data on uh, the, the, the return rate for the people who have benefited from the, the pilot? We don't yet because it hasn't been 
in operation very long. Um, I mean, we can start to get data on folks who uh, we assessed in April, May, June. They've probably had at least one, if not more, court dates. But we're going to get that data from the Office of Court Administration in one big administrative data dump uh, in the next couple of months. But we can certainly do that a little sooner, given that, of course, that's the question that we all we all want to know. Yeah. And um, is the program scalable? We're about to go into mm -hmm. um, budget season. Great question. And you know, the council fought for this money, and yep. and uh, it seems like it's going well. Could you bring it to? Could we bring it to scale? All, yep. It's you a know, great question. Five boroughs. Yep. Every arraignment, like, how do we do that? It's a great question and one that we are talking actively about because we want this to be part of the infrastructure that already exists. Uh, we don't need to have Vera be everywhere. That isn't a good use of us or of resources and money. Um, so one idea is to have the existing supervised release providers, given that they are in every single shift um, in each borough, be the folks who sort of uh, also do this. Um, we've actually found, certainly in the Bronx and in Queens, that there are cases where the supervised release provider might actually say, hey, this case, we can't take it. The person is too high risk or isn't charge eligible. Will you guys do your assessment? So we're actually finding there's a natural kind of sink there, and maybe there's a way to actually make it formal um, and have another existing provider who's in the courtroom be the person who does this assessment. We would like to finish out the course of our pilot, which is another year. Um, certainly been speaking with your staff about that, but we need to think about how to scale this for as long as we have money bail. I do think that this is something that should be in every courtroom for every arraignment shift. Um, and I think the most obvious way to do that is through the existing providers who are in each shift already. Right, because Vera is not in the business of providing this service. You piloting it and providing the analysis. That's exactly right. Uh, and you know, originally this kind of got started with a bill that we had which would have given CJA the responsibility for collecting this information, et cetera, and then through conversations and negotiations it was agreed that, well, let's let's do this pilot through Vera and, and, yeah. and see how that, that works. Yeah, and a couple of thoughts about that. One is uh, the way the bill was originally drafted was that CJA would do it as part of their interview that they do for every single person arrested. And we think the, the defense attorney as gatekeeper is really important. If 70% of cases are just getting ROR'd mm -hmm. anyway, we don't want judges to have information that might actually tip the scale towards more bail being set. So that's uh, a sort of a natural caution um, to actually doing it that way. The other thing is we have 30 questions. It takes six to seven minutes max. But that is, uh, I think, about four minutes more than Aubrey would say his folks downstairs um, <laughs> for every single interview could, could manage. So we would have to think carefully about if this were to roll out to scale, how do we do so in a way that doesn't compromise uh, the individualized nature of the assessment because we actually think that matters. If it starts to look kind of rote or without that individualized consideration, I bet the impact that it will actually have on judges will begin to diminish. Got it. And council member, I wanted yeah. to answer your questions. My wonderful staff were here who are the sort of brains behind this operation and hold all of the data. Um, that case that you asked about where we had assessed the person as being able to afford a $50 partially secured bond, it was a case where the district attorney's office uh, requested $3,000 bail. We had put our assessment on the record and uh, the judge ROR'd that particular individual. So that's what oh. happened there. Um, and one thing that my staff reminded me is of those 30% of cases where we've done an assessment and people are ROR'd or released under supervision, uh, what we found is that judges, we think, hear the amount of bail somebody can afford and it is so low that they're like, well, I don't really want this to keep them in. At least that's what I'm assuming is the, the thought process behind it, which is why I think we're seeing a fair number of cases where we've done an assessment and provided this information <coughs> actually lead to an ROR decision. And I think I shared this with you before and I'm happy to share it on the record, but 
in our first week of operation, um, we were in the Bronx. I actually was the person who did the assessment and went on the record. And it was a judge in front of whom I had practiced and who I have a very nice relationship. And we put on the record what this particular individual could afford uh, in terms of a bail amount, which was $80 partially secured bond. And the judge calls me up uh, and off the record is basically like, it's a little absurd that we're talking about $80 partially secured bond. That's an absurd amount. And I said, well, with all due respect, it's a little absurd that we're talking about cash bail for a woman who has none. And that little interaction, ultimately she was released, um, I think that little interaction meant something, right? Because that judge had to actually confront the decision that even if I set a low bail, $250, $500, which is usually the going rate uh, <laughs> for the lowest bail possible, at least in the Bronx, that that would have kept this individual in. And I think judges are forced to confront that question head on. Is this a case where I want this individual to remain in jail pretrial, or is this a case where I'm comfortable with this individual being at liberty? And I think that is the value of what this information presents, is, is having to confront that question. A hundred percent. Having the, the, the court confront um, what, it is, what it is doing and giving consideration to what a person really has and can afford and, and what does it really mean to just throw out $500, $1,000, like it's nothing. Yeah. Um, a, a big uh, impetus for this was to get the system to, 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 to confront and to, and to reconcile with what it's doing to people for these seemingly low amounts of, um, low amounts of, of, of bail. Um, so um, for Bex, You are constrained by the $5,000 bail amount. Are there substantive constraints based on charges? No, any, any person who gets bail of 5,000 or less, regardless of the charge, would be eligible for our program. So um, what, if anything, how, how if any, any way would you, would you want to be able to expand the BEX program, right? Because unlike the Vera Pilot Project, it's not two days a week. It's not, yep. you know, just in a couple of courthouses. This is citywide, 24/7, right? Yep. You have the $5,000 jurisdictional limit. If that were lifted, what would be the the impact? Would the, would the difference be be marginal? Would it would it create a different um, dynamic that wouldn't be helpful? Yeah. Why, why a $5,000 cap? Is that is that useful at this point? Well, I think there's some trade-offs if you go to the higher amounts. One is it's probably a, uh, a little less likely that they would be able to pay bail. So there's a kind of uh, resource issue and benefit issue. The other one is that we, we have chosen not to work with the bail bonds industry. So the higher the bail amount, the more likely that you would bring a bail bonds person in to pay the bail. And we don't see ourselves as facilitating that process. Um, but it is something that you know, we could certainly consider because I do think um, there's a real value to all the work that we do and it really comes down to kind of the minutia of the process and the personal relationships we have in the courthouse um, to try to move things along. So, I mean, I, I think there's costs and benefits on either side, but it's something that we'd be willing to take a look at. Right. And I know in your, in your written testimony, you gave the figures for uh, people returning for their for their court appearances who have been RR'd. It was 88% in 2018. Yeah, and that that's a that's a high standard. It means that 88% of defendants given an RR showed up for every single court date. Okay, and that wouldn't include among the other 12%. It might include someone who missed a court date but then showed up subsequently. It's not doesn't mean that 12% of them had to be tracked down. Correct, and right. keep in mind that the, be the best we know from the national, that the national average is about 23% of defendants fail to appear for a court date. So we're, we're twice as good, essentially, as do, do you have any? Cities. Do you have any metrics on the people who uh, were, what's the term, uh, fully served by, by the BEX program, like they, they weren't RRR'd, some bail was paid, someone came and helped them pay it. Like, what's their return rate? 
So, um, We'd have so, to so what was it like when I yeah. participated in the in the mass bailout with the uh, RFK Foundation, right? One of the knocks against it was, well, if someone else is paying bail for the person, they don't have the same interest in returning, and now that's somewhat different than the the other person paying bail is their family member as opposed to just some random stranger. But still, curious. One of the things we have heard is this encourages people being released on bail. That is supported by someone other than the defendant themselves. So do you have any information on the return rate? Well, generally speaking, we, we do know that low amounts of bail do not seem to, to do better than a uh, release on recognizance at promoting court appearance. So it, it's hard to set the, that dollar amount with specificity, but you, you could say that for a person who has bail of $5,000 or less, it's, it's a relatively small amount of money. And so we do not see that a similarly situated person, defendant with the same characteristics who just happened to have gotten ROR versus $5,000 bail, we would not expect them to perform differently in terms of their court appearance rate. What we don't know is if you go to the much higher levels of bail, what would happen if you were to ROR that person versus set that bail amount. Right. So essentially it does not appear that low amounts of bail does anything to improve court appearance rates relative to a release on recognizance. Um, yeah, what um what kind of metrics or, or data reporting is Mach J requiring of of each of you, uh, pursuant to to the funding for these programs? I mean, we we share a lot of the information that you're seeing in front of you. We do monthly reporting, uh, and Mach J reviews the figures on a monthly basis, um, and you know we're working on kind of an annual report of what you're seeing. 11 months of data. And uh, we're still negotiating uh, the, the terms of our contract, but our understanding of what we would be reporting is uh, number of cases assessed, um, you know, bail setting, bail payment, uh, return to court, as well as case disposition mm -hmm. and pretrial rearrest. Those are all metrics that we'll be um, tracking over the course of this pilot. And, and just to add one more point, so you, the, the standard we're using for the, what we report to the city is fairly high. We want to make it clear that there are some people who, even if our program didn't exist, they would pay bail anyway, right? So we're trying to understand the, Im the kind of unique impact of our program. So we, we ex intentionally exclude, for example, those defendants who, who pay bail kind of immediately ar at arraignment. So for example, they might have a family member sitting right there in court who raise their hand and say, I'm ready to pay bail right now. And there are, in fact, um, you know, a substantial number of people who do that. So we're only looking at those people for whom they're not able to immediately pay bail. Um, and we meet with them immediately after arraignment, and we try to provide them with some assistance. So you don't operate, Bex doesn't operate in Staten Island? Not at the moment. Why we, is that? Well, we, we've we been running Bex for several decades now. We expanded to, used to only operate in Bronx and Queens. So uh, interesting um, comparison to FIRA. Uh, until 2010 when we expanded to Manhattan and Brooklyn. Um, but we're, we're certainly happy and we're, we've been we're starting to look at what it would take to um, build the program in Staten Island. Has there been any objection from the Staten Island DA or OCA in Staten Island? Like who? No objection. I think the, I mean, the issue for us is that there's kind of a sunk cost to operating Bex. You know, the, we depend on the fact that we have a substantial number of staff deployed in the courthouses where we operate. And on top of that, we build the Bex program. So it's just a question of, whether we're able to invest the, the resources that we would need to be there kind of all the time, basically. So at a recent hearing, we heard complaints that people were not being held um, and were being put on the bus and sent to Rikers Island, uh, not only in violation of, of the city law, but uh, in, in, in making it impossible for, uh, for Bex to, to work its magic. So what's your experience with 
the holds that you are, are requesting from people being honored. Oh, okay, so citywide where, where we're operating. Um, I, as I said, you know, we, we do track the proportion of times that, are, that are, when we place a hold, the defendant is able to pay bail at arraignment, and that has stayed at a fairly high proportion, around 70%, uh, and ticked up a little bit recently. We do work to resolve individual instances where there's some kind of miscommunication with Department of Corrections and we've issued a hold that the person is put on the bus. And I, and I will say that no system is perfect, but what I've found is that in general, I, I would say Department of Corrections is much more responsive and much more aware of their obligations and responsibilities. Um, and so we have much clearer kind of lines of communications with them. So when there is an issue, we're able to bring it to their attention. And they do take these instances seriously. And, and it's important to us, and I'll say this even to folks in this room, that you know, we get information from social media. We hear about individual instances where uh, people have concerns about holds not being respected. And we follow up on all of them. So it's really helpful for us to get information wherever we can, where people have concerns about individual holds. All right, well, thank you very much for your testimony and thank you for the good work that you, that you do. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so now we'll hear from um, some public defenders. Uh, DeWitt, uh, sorry. I can't read the last name, I'm sorry. The Bronx Defenders, Josh Norkin from Legal Aid, and Dave Long from the Liberty Fund. Not all defenders. Good afternoon. If you raise your right hand so we can swear you in, you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Um, we can just go from my left to right, and that'd be great. <clears throat> Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Lansman and uh, members of the committee. My name is Dawid Gitacho. I'm a criminal defense attorney and uh, associate special counsel to the criminal defense practice at the Bronx Defenders. And um, I wanna thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, the Bronx Defenders is a community-based and nationally recognized holistic public defender office d dedicated to serving the people of the Bronx. Um, and we represent over 28 individuals, uh, 28,000 individuals every year providing uh, criminal defense, family defense, immigration representation, civil legal services, social work support, and other advocacy to indigent people in the Bronx. And the Bronx uh, and beyond, the Bronx Defenders promotes criminal justice reform to dismantle the culture of mass incarceration. As the end of 2018 approaches, the need to fix New York City's broken bail system is no longer out, up for debate consensus among New Yorkers is that people should not stay in jail simply because they cannot afford to pay for their freedom. And to this end, I understand that various stakeholders, including the city council, have taken steps over the past year to address some of the obstacles that the current bail system erects against our clients and their families. The Bronx Defenders welcomes these efforts and we appreciate the opportunity to provide some of the feedback on the measures that have been implemented this year in particular, we hope to relay our experiences as public defenders with the use of the alternative forms of bail, the bail assessment project implemented by the Vera Institute of Justice and the BEX program. Now, I, I do wanna start with uh, really reiterating the significance of uh, th these alternative forms uh, of bail. Um, such programs, um, and providing the alternative forms of bail payment specifically um, dramatically increases the likelihood that people will avoid pretrial detention while fulfilling the only purpose for bail, ensuring their return to court in the future. Um, now, 
specifically, uh, alternatives like partially secured bond ease the bail payment process, increases the chance that clients will be released from court and avoid jail time altogether. Um, in contrast, uh, the process of securing the service of a bail bonds company generally requires time and virtually guarantees that clients will be held in for additional hours, if not days, for bail to be posted. Uh, and this delay obviously disrupts the lives of our clients, but also costs New York City taxpayers by needlessly keeping people in jail. Um, I, I do want to give the example of one of my clients uh, this year, uh, John, who was arrested on felony charges. Um, by any measure, John was eligible to be released on his own re recognizance. He had no criminal record or prior failures to appear in court. He was born and raised in the Bronx and he was employed and he lived in the Bronx with his wife and two children. And family members were also present in the courthouse for support. Now during the interview prior to the arraignment, it was clear that John was very worried that he would lose his job if he didn't show up to work the following morning. Uh, he was more concerned about the prospect of not being able to financially support his family more than uh, spending the night in jail. Um, and in that case, um, you know, the court did end up setting bail, but also provided the option for a partially secured bond in the amount of $10,000 with a 10% deposit. As a result of that, John's brother was able to step in as surety following the arraignment and posted the required amount immediately. And John was released shortly thereafter. And the important thing to note is although John's family uh, came to court with some amount of money, it was not enough for the cash bail that was also set in the case. Um, and furthermore, the John's arraignment occurred, it was late at night during night arraignments, approximately around after 11 p.m. So the option of going to a bail bonds company uh, was not really fe feasible without risking that John would be transported to Rikers and potentially staying for an extended period of time. So the court's decision to set a partially secured bond w ensured that John was able to reunite with his family that night and averted a potential job loss. Since then, John has appeared on all of his court dates while maintaining his employment and the abil ability to support his family. The outcome in John's case, however, remains unusual for many of our clients uh, because cash bail and insurance company bond uh, are still the primary and often the only options that are made available to them. We recognize that there have been, there's been an uptick in the use of alternative forms of bail. Uh, we've seen that judges are setting partially secured bond and credit card bail in an increasing number of cases and defense attorneys also regularly request the court to consider partially secured bond as an option if the court decides to set bail. Likewise, Vera's bail assessment project has increased awareness about partially secured bond among judges, attorneys, clients, and their families. Although these trends are encouraging, there continues to be significant inertia against normalizing the use of alternative forms of bail. The use of unsecured bond is virtually unheard of. Furthermore, it's rare that judges will set partially secured bond without a specific request from defense attorneys. Even worse, many judges hesitate or outright refuse to provide it as an option when asked by counsel. And in many of these cases, the de decision to do so, um, that is not provide an alternative, is effectively remanding our clients as they wait for uh, the case to proceed. Now, the reluctance to fully embrace partially secured bond has become more apparent in light of the efforts by the Bail Assessment Project. Since the pilot began earlier this year, the Bronx Defenders attorneys have referred a number of cases to uh, the project which has conducted an independent assessment of our client's ability to pay bail and make recommendations to, to the court as to the appropriate type and amount of bail based on their findings. Now, as uh, Insha uh, stated earlier, the majority of our clients that uh, we refer to the project were found to have no ability to pay bail. And you know, in the cases where 
uh, the project found that clients had some resources, the bail assessment project always recommended partially secured if bail was to be set. Um, however, we've, we saw that despite these recommendations, uh, oftentimes bail was set only as cash bail, insurance company bond, and sometimes it's credit card bail. And, uh, I, and I think what they stated earlier, the numbers reflect that. And uh, while some judges did occasionally set partially secured bond, we found that the amount was often higher than what, what our clients were assessed to afford by the project, which pretty much defeats the purpose of providing an alternative uh, so form So what you're saying is the bail. court was ignoring Vera's recommendation? At times, we certainly felt that the, it, the actual uh, amount that was uh, recommended by Vera was not accepted by the, by, by the judges and would often more pretty much, uh, and uh, with the exception of a very few cases, um, I, I, they usually set at a much higher uh, amount than uh, what Vera recommended. Did, did they ever, uh, did the court ever uh, explain itself? Oh, no, I'm not doing that because X, Y, and Z. Or is there any reason that you can uh, discern any, any, any principled reason or, or, or recurring theme? Unfortunately, uh, those conversations we haven't been able to uh, have with, with, the, uh, with the judges. However, I, I do think that it has to do with the general culture of uh, the criminal courts, which has been uh, sluggish in terms of changing um, the usual, uh, changing the practice of setting the usual amounts and types of, uh, of bail. Um, you know, we are faced with this culture uh, that's resistant to change uh, when it comes to bail setting practices. And in and, and the case of uh, uh, trying to determine why a judge would set a higher amount is often very difficult at arraignments when uh, attorneys are waiting for uh, the next case to come up um, and ends up being pushed aside and we uh, judges continue uh, to the next case. So that opportun opportunity is not there. However, what's useful about having uh, these recommendations is the advocacy uh, efforts continue once bail has been set after and following court dates, uh, such as during, doing bail reviews or writs, uh, which we've had certain experience of referring to uh, the recommendation that was proposed by, uh, that was made by Vera uh, as part of our advocacy to reduce uh, the amount of bail that was set uh, in, during bail reviews. So uh, we do think that it's helpful, and I do want to reiterate that uh, the point that Vera made uh, uh, about having the assessment and the tools to be used at the discretion of defense attorneys. I, I think it's important that uh, the, these, this tool is used in conjunction with having conversations with uh, the criminal defense attorneys who have the initial interaction with our clients and based on their, the information that they have can speak to uh, uh, the necessity of having this uh, assessment. And with respect to the question uh, that you raised uh, earlier, which, uh, which was does it induce judges uh, to perhaps set bail because the tools were uh, presented in court on the record. And it's hard to say, uh, unfortunately, there's certainly no measurement on the motivations of the judges. However, I think based on the conversations I've had with the attorneys, uh, I think one, the way one person explained it is, um, I'm not sure if it helped, but I certainly do think that it didn't hurt. Um, so I. I think the general sentiment among um, defense attorneys is like this could be useful and we have seen that in some cases it, it is uh, it, it has been useful to really uh, have uh, the record be presented to the judges um, about their ability our clients ability to to pay to pay bail um, 
Now, I, I do want to add another thing, uh, which was um, there's also a sentiment that whenever partially secured bonds are set, usually a surety, a family member has to step in and a judge has to uh, take a, a brief moment to swear them in and review the associated pa paperwork that's provided. And this brief procedure usually takes a few minutes um, and it's something uh, we've actually seen courts conduct with bail uh, insurance, uh, commercial bail bonds companies. Um, and that's generally treated as an annoyance that's, uh, that interrupts the regular court proceedings instead of uh, something that's an important uh, part of uh, the court system. Um, so there is this uh, reluctance to adopt it fully uh, into the day-to-day -day operations. Um, in addition, uh, we've seen that our clients continue to face other obstacles while attempting to navigate the process. Uh, the paperwork associated with partially secured bond can be daunting for our clients and attorneys and other advocates have had to step in to assist them with the process. Uh, we're also concerned that the inquiries by some judges when people seek to po post bond can be arbitrary. Um, there have been instances when judges have required excessive and unnecessary documentation as proof of income uh, and assets erecting uh, another set of obstacles for our clients and possibly extending uh, the time that our clients remain in jail. Um, I do want to turn to uh, briefly about the BEX program. Um, it, we want to note that you know we we feel that the criminal justice agency uh, provides an important role in ensuring that our clients will not be turned over to the Department of Corrections, and facilitating bail payment by contacting friends and family members. Um, and I d we also want to note that. Uh, the CJA has been interfacing with the bail funds and we've been informed that they now place holds on, on all bail fund uh, eligible clients without CJA uh, checking for sureties. Uh, I think that's a critical step. Uh, we do have, um, the bail funds have been playing an important role uh, in our courts and we do think that uh, this type of uh, cooperation is essential in, in ensuring that people are actually bailed out, uh, even when they don't have family members who cannot uh, pay bail, uh, because these uh, bail funds do, uh, uh, in fact, step in. Um, we've also seen an increased willingness on the part of DOC to honor court households for our clients. Uh, nevertheless, we have, have noticed that occasionally clients slip through the cracks and are shipped off to Rikers due to some oversight. Uh, for example, in one case where an attorney placed a hold on a client who had partially secured bond set at his arraignment uh, because a family member was coming to court to place bail, was still transported to Rikers. And unfortunately, no explanation was given as to why this occurred. Um, but uh, based when I spoke to the attorney about this, she speculated that uh, her client shared the same first name and last name as another person who was also arraigned around the uh, same time. And um, that, we don't have additional information and I, I, we do believe that it's necessary to figure out why certain things happen because while administrative error can and do occur, uh, the stakes are certainly far too high to simply brush it aside and say that this was just some administrative error. Um, <clears throat> so I do want to end that uh, with uh, brief recommendations. Uh, specifically, uh, we do think that raising awareness of additional forms of bail, as Vera has been doing, uh, is an important piece of uh, changing the culture. Uh, furthermore, encouraging judges to set alternative forms of bail that are less onerous than insurance company bonds, and really to impose the least financially burdensome conditions necessary to ensure the people of, uh, that people return to court is important. Uh, we also recommend that um, there are steps to be taken regarding simplifying the paperwork and procedures required for alternative forms of bail. 
Uh, we do uh, support expanding the use of independent assessments like the bail calculator implemented by the bail assessment project to determine a person's ability to pay bail and really working with the defense uh, to ensure that client's abilities uh, is actually presented to, to the judge prior to making a decision about bail. And lastly, uh, we do support the, the providing additional resources for bail facilitators. So you, as you heard earlier, uh, Vera's work, um, based on communicating with, with family members and, uh, and friends is an essential piece of uh, ensuring that people come to court and bail is paid as soon as possible so that clients uh, do not, are not transported to Rikers. And we do believe that these are not radical uh, recommendations. They are sensible and, and real steps towards improving the current bail setting practices. Uh, however, we do recognize that the problems that are facing the current bail system are longstanding and deeply structural. So we are in need of comprehensive solutions if we are to address the tremendous hardship that is inflicted upon New Yorkers by uh, the criminal legal system. So I thank you for the time. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to start by introducing myself. My name is Joshua Norkin. I am a staff attorney uh, with the Legal Aid Society Special Litigation Unit. I focus on bail reform. And I want to thank uh, not just uh, Council Member Lansman, but the City Council, as well as all of my colleagues in the room, uh, as the testimony from uh, both Vera and the Criminal Justice Agency indicate, uh, in the absence of legislative reform in Albany, this city has taken tremendous strides to in changing uh, the bail system uh, relatively dramatically, I think, in the past several years. And so I think this conversation is an important one because I think it is about what can we continue to do to ensure uh, that downward trend continues, uh, especially if uh, we don't get uh, legislative reform uh, in Albany this year. And I'd like to just start uh, by saying uh, that uh, this conversation uh, can't be had without acknowledging uh, the people that are impacted by the system. Um, and earlier this year, uh, as part of our work, we wrote to incarcerated clients in upstate uh, facility, prison facilities asking them how in bail impacted their lives. And we heard back, uh, you know, tremendous stories from them uh, that were totally heartbreaking and uh, show how even though the system has made progress, uh, there continue to be individual instances uh, in which unaffordable bail is set on people uh, that, places, uh, that places those people's rights uh, at, in jeopardy. And uh, one client wrote to us that bail was set at $25,000 and as the father of four and someone who only collects SSI disability, there's no way I could afford to take that money out of my kid's mouth and still consider myself a decent man. Another, a 19-year-old teenager, uh, wanted to know where he was supposed to find $50,000 to buy his freedom. Another wrote to us and told us that bail was ransom. Uh, so today, the use of money bail in New York City's criminal courts, uh, while potentially better and not as devastating as it once was, uh, still renders the presumption of innocence barely recognizable. And in October of this past uh, year, uh, just over a year ago in 2017, uh, we released a study with the Human Rights Data Analysis Group that shows that those individual clients that continue to have bail set on them at arraignments are 34% more likely to be convicted uh, simply because bail is set. And it's for these reasons that the Legal Aid Society has long supported the greater use of unsecured and partially secured bonds in New York City's courts. Uh, while the legislature passed an expansive statutory scheme in the 1970s aimed at reducing the jail population, it's never been fully utilized to its uh, full potential. Uh, these forms of bail are clearly geared towards our clients, uh, our clients with no disposable income, um, and uh, they're the types of bail that we will need to rely on as an in-between uh, when judges are not willing to release people uh, individually. And so one of the things that's come up at this hearing um, is sort of this intersection of the alternative forms of bail as well as assessments about our client's ability to pay uh, any bail set, whether that's cash, uh, partially secured bonds, or insurance company bail. And I think the underlying theme here is uh, some type of judicial oversight 
um, or some, uh, I think, inquiry into whether or not judges and the bench and the judiciary recognizes, recognize what their roles and responsibility are. Uh, the Legal Aid Society has long supported uh, efforts of the City Council as well as uh, VERA and, of course, uh, the Criminal Justice Agency to, uh, take it to force judges to take into consideration our client's ability to pay monetary bail when it's set. And over the past uh, two years, uh, the Legal Aid Society itself has been engaged in systemic litigation uh, trying to uh, force the judiciary's hand in terms of considering arguments, constitutional arguments, that impose a requirement on judges that they consider our ability, our client's ability to pay and seek out less restrictive alternatives before setting that amount of bail. Our opinion, in our opinion, a New York City judge who sets monetary bail and incarcerates a presumpti presumptively innocent individual without making an inquiry into their ability to pay and without seeking out those less restrictive alternatives violates the Equal Protection Clause of the United States Constitution. Such illegal practices are still endemic to bail setting in New York City's courts. Supreme Court jurisprudence establishes uh, clearly that in equal, in, an e in equal protection principles that are all too frequently ignored, that the state may not incarcerate somebody because of their poverty unless it first inquires into the reasons that that person may not be able to pay and without seeking an alternative to incarceration. Um, for over two years, we've raised these arguments in the city's uh, courts. Uh, we've raised them in every borough of New York City. Uh, we've presented them to both the appellate divisions. Uh, we've uh, taken them to the Court of Appeals, and we've taken them to federal court. Uh, our staff in the trial offices has consistently challenged the setting of secured money bail beyond what our individual clients can pay. Our arguments have largely been ignored by the judiciary and discarded by judges on the bench. While there is little the City Council can do uh, to impact judicial practices directly, uh, the VERA ability to pay pilot represents a promising start. Uh, what we would encourage the City Council to do uh, is, and, is to continue to hold these hearings and to continue to think about how to place, judge, uh, place pressure on judges and actors in the system to set partially secured and unsecured bonds in amounts that our clients can pay and to recognize that when these courts rely on these types of more flexible forms of bail, uh, not only will they continue to ensure that uh, the appearance rates uh, that Mr. Fox uh, touted here earlier will stay that high, but it means that more people will be released in accordance with, with constitutional principles. Uh, by presenting judges with more information about our clients' ability to pay and for the city council to call for a fuller use of the existing bail options, the city will take a large step toward fulfilling the promises of the Equal Protection Clause and guaranteeing that all of the citizens coming through the criminal justice system will be treated equally and fairly by the law. I will say one uh, final thing, and uh, this didn't make it into our testimony, but I do want to tell uh, the council member this, which is that at the moment, um, I, I raise that we have been filing litigation in all of the boroughs uh, challenging uh, the setting of money bail as being unconstitutional. Often our opposing counsel in those, uh, in those writs of habeas corpus tends to be the local district attorney's office. I'd like to take out the opportunity to point out that the respondent in each and every single one of those cases is actually Cynthia Brand, the commissioner of the Department of Corrections. Why uh, corporate counsel or the city's counsel does not intervene or state a position in these cases, uh, I'm not entirely sure other than to say that it seems that this is just a pattern in practice of how these cases have been handled uh, over the course of the past however many, many centuries. But I think it is fair to point out that we have repeatedly sued effectively the city of New York over these practices um, and we have repeatedly met opposition. We have not filed a writ or challenged a monetary bail decision that a district attorney has not opposed uh, in this city. Say that again? What's that? Say that last part again. We have not filed a writ. I, there may be one floating out there, but I don't think we have filed a writ or a legal challenge uh, in this city in which the district attorney has not opposed in some way, shape, or form. But, but who's representing, when you say the, the, the district attorney has not opposed, it's the corporation counsel that's responding? I don't, I don't wanna. What I'm saying is that when we file a writ of habeas corpus, right. and what, uh, as I explained, which we've been doing systematically, the 
respondent that is listed on that proceeding, which is a civil proceeding under Article uh, 70 of the Civil Procedure Laws. The respondent in those proceedings is the Department of Corrections. It's Cynthia Brand. And the responding attorney, the person who has showed up to represent the city's position or Cynthia Brand's position in those writs of habeas corpus, has been the local district attorney's offices. Right. So I would imagine given the position of the city council as well as the mayor of New York City, that the city council's position on the setting of money, uh, I'm sorry, that the city of New York's position on the imposition of money bail is dramatically different than those of the local district attorney's offices. Got it. Thank you. Sir? Chair Lansman, members and staff of the city council, thank you for the opportunity to present my views to this committee. My name is Dave Long and I'm the Executive Director of the Liberty Fund, the first citywide city council funded charitable bail organization in New York City. Our mission is to reduce the number of New Yorkers subjected to pretrial detention. The Liberty Fund is distinct from other charitable bail funds in this city because of our work, because our work happens directly in arraignment courts every night of the year, from 6 p.m. until court closes, usually around 1 a.m. We began operations in August 2017 and to date have posted bail for 614 men and women. I have included with my testimony today a summary report of our outcomes from our first year. Today, I will offer three points that I hope will inform the conversation about the future of bail. First, as long as cash bail is required for misdemeanors, it is crucial that we continue to fund and support the work of charitable bail funds. The Liberty Fund and the other charitable bail funds in New York City, Bronx Freedom Fund and Brooklyn Community Bail Fund, are keeping people who have not been found guilty of misdemeanor charges out of our correctional system. Instead of the trauma and disruption of going to jail, our clients leave court, return home to their jobs, their families, and their lives. Second, through our experience providing on-the-ground intervention, the Liberty Fund has gained insights into the social service needs of the bail and the ROR population. We intervene at a crucial moment, immediately after bail is set and before a person boards the bus to Rikers. After we post bail, we voluntarily offer service refer referrals. In our first year, over a third of our clients requested assistance with housing, employment, substance abuse, mental health, immigration entitlements, and other services. Clearly, this demonstrates a gap in our criminal justice system. And that leads me to the third and most important point. In any post-bail reform world, the Liberty Fund can be an important partner in providing social service interventions. As the bail reform movement progresses, the Liberty Fund should be leveraged into an intervention to fill social service referral gaps in our criminal justice system. Going forward, we can help people meet their basic needs, make their court dates, and ultimately help prevent future involvement with our criminal justice system. In conclusion, the work of the city's charitable bail funds have demonstrated that removing pretrial detention for misdemeanor offenses is more efficient and less disruptive in people's lives. As we move forward, we will continue to promote, promote a more fair, humane, and effective criminal justice system for, more, for all. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Um, could each of you just describe what interactions your respective organizations have with the bail facilitators or from, from the bail assessment project or the, or the BEX folks and, and whether those are good and meaningful and, and, and productive and whether or not there might be some improvements you can identify? <clears throat> so I'll, I'll start with uh, the bail assessment project. And uh, you, you know, the way that has been implemented has been really good. They've, Vera reached out to us, has been working with um, the Bronx Defenders and, uh, and informing us what their roles are and has been uh, very open to uh, hearing what the concerns are and um, at arraignments, um, being present and available is, is always an important piece and ensuring that clients are able, um, are comfortable with having another person um, present asking them questions um, in the back. Um, and upon doing that, upon making, uh, presenting their findings to the attorney, um, leaving it to the defense to make a decision about whether or not to uh, present it to uh, uh, present it on the record uh, has been a crucial uh, 
part of like the working relationship that we've had with Vera. So uh, I do think that that's, uh, that's been helpful. Um, in terms of uh, with the bail facilitators, we have less of a, um, a direct interaction. We usually communicate with them in terms of uh, asking, asking them to place holds uh, for our clients because we believe that someone is coming uh, to pay bail. Uh, we do um, occasionally go downstairs uh, to where our clients are being held, but uh, we do not have any interactions with our clients at that point. They, they you know, DOC will not let us uh, speak to them after bail has been set. Uh, so th the only place that, the only individuals that we can speak to have been uh, the bail facilitators and generally they've been helpful. Uh, although the outcome um, is um, until recently, as we have found in many occasions that our clients are still transported to, to Rikers. Um, and we don't have information about like why that has, uh, that has happened um, or uh, understand you know, what, what can be done uh, better. So I, I do think that there's always room for improvement. Uh, we do think that bail facilitators, uh, their presence of bail facilitators within the courthouse having um, uh, additional interaction with the defense attorneys um, is a significant piece because the, the contacting families takes time. Uh, clients may be more likely to tell their attorneys about um, you know, what, what sort of contacts they have and we can ask additional questions that could be helpful uh, to the facilitator. So we do think that um, having the resource, uh, providing resources for additional uh, bail facilitators, whether that's with CJA or directly with uh, defense organizations, is something that can be uh, useful. Um, I, I just want to say, I think I mentioned this at the beginning of the, my testimony, but the work that both uh, Vera and CJA have been doing, I think, is incredibly important and we're entirely supportive of. Uh, I don't know if there's a lot to recommend in terms of improvement. I think as Ms. Rahman mentions, the pilot program is still, they're still learning about it and it's still in its infancy and we're still waiting to get statistics uh, back on it. I think uh, to their credit, uh, so far it's uh, worked well and I think the way that it's set up has worked well. Um, you know, with Bex and with the Criminal Justice Agency, I will say, you know, I'll say that um, we speak pretty regularly with the Criminal Justice Agency. Um, we spoke with folks uh, there uh, just yesterday about uh, an issue. Uh, in terms of Bex, you know, one thing that I have uh, mentioned in the past, and I think it's worth uh, still considering, is trying to make more information about it publicly available. Um, and that might be true with the Vera pilot as well. I think one thing that tends to happen in the fast-paced world of arraignments and just you know, the defense bar generally, is that there are so many competing issues that our attorneys have to deal with, that clerks have to deal with. Um, getting the information down in paper, uh, doing trainings and doing sort of repetitive trainings uh, becomes important to let that information uh, sink in. I think in the past, you know, I have heard uh, instances where people, uh, our attorneys in the courtroom, were either confused by the parameters of what the BEX system was or who the bail facilitators, facilitators are. And so, um, you know, I've cer we've certainly said we'd open the door uh, for everybody to come in and do a training or help develop materials that might be helpful, um, you know, to, to sort of facilitate or promote the program. And I think that's all to say that these are relatively minor things. I mean, that's not a big ask. Um, and I think the real, the real issue here in which, you know, I tried, I hoped uh, I conveyed in my testimony is that I don't really think this is, this is not, the issue isn't here, it's not CJA, it's not VERA, but it's, it's, it's always, at the end of the day, convincing that judge sitting in front of you um, and making sure that that judge is informed about what these programs are, what the setting of bail means, uh, you know, and trying to convince those judges that making that inquiry into somebody's ability to pay and then using something like an unsecured bond that to me right now is the, is the tar target audience. And I recognize that the city council's got uh, limited control over that. Um, but I think what I would say is that, you know, if it's VERA or CJA, that's the messenger and they need, you know, either additional resources to do that or more funding to support those programs. I think that's uh, an entry point that the city council considering, uh, can consider to help. 
Does the Liberty Fund interact with either Vera or, or Beck's folks? Uh, yes, very much so. I mean, since we're in all the boroughs, uh, we wouldn't be able to really do what we do without the help and assistance of CJA. They have been tremendously helpful right from the start in providing uh, guidance and resources and, and, assist, and assistance whenever we need it. So, you know, we, we interact with them nightly uh, and their staff. You know, I've met with uh, Vera and, uh, and CJA on, on various different uh, components of bail reform. Um, and, and all of the defense councils also, defense council organizations, legal aid and Bronx defenders and all, all of them included have been extremely helpful in uh, helping us get to the point that we are at. I would say based upon the hearing from last week, one suggestion I would put forth is that uh, I believe you, you suggested a, um, a work group, a bail reform work group to the Department of Corrections to expand that group to involve as many players that are testifying today uh, and entities would, I think, be helpful so that they can hear uh, more uh, information about what's going on on a daily basis in court. Got it. And, and just to, I think that you've both talked about it, but I just want to be clear, both of the public defender organizations, you're, you're satisfied that the way this, the Vera bail pilot has been set up, that we're not inadvertently exposing people to bail who would otherwise not uh, have bail set. We, we I mean, this is, a, this, is, this is like the age old concern with trying to move the system from, you know, basically cash and insurance company bail to partially secured and unsecured bonds, right? The ROR population as both uh, the pre, you know, as both CJA and Vera mentioned in New York City is so high that any you risk seriously in any bail reform, whether that's state legislative reform, city council reform, or even these you know, smaller pilot program reforms, uh, inadvertently cutting into that ROR population by doing something like this. Um, I think it's fair to say that uh, we probably don't have enough information, as Ms. Rahman said, about exactly what the program is doing or how judges are utilizing it just yet. The sample size is pretty small comparatively to the number of cases that come through New York City criminal courts every year. And so I think, you know, the best way, um, you know, the best thing to say about it is that it's, it's a real concern. Um, it would be a concern whether or not Vera was in that courtroom or not um, as the city transitions away from uh, the, the current system. And I think it's something that you, you've got to keep an eye on. And I think that's one of those things where these hearings are important, uh, the constant reporting of data, full transparency is important because it's something that, you know, we, we're, we're really sort of on the brink, especially if you look at misdemeanor cases in New York City where release rates are close to 90%. Um, you don't want to dip into that ROR rate by starting to set bail on people or having more people inadvertently detained because we tried to do something uh, that was righteous and it had the adverse effect. All right. Thank you all for your testimony. Thank you. Um, so now we'll just do have some questions for Mock J. Um, if they want to come up, Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. Good afternoon. Hi, you just good swear afternoon. you're in. You swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you. Um, just state your name for the record. My name is Sarah Cassell. I'm a program manager at the Mayor's Office of Criminal okay. Justice. And my understanding is that Mock J doesn't have testimony for us, but you're available here to answer questions that we have? Correct. Terrific. So um, could you describe for us what uh, coordinating uh, Mock J uh, uh, either arranged or participated in amongst the public defenders, Vera, the district attorneys in the Bronx and Queens, and um, the, the judiciary in, in the Bronx and Queens to, to get people ready for the pilot? Um, I can't speak to that program in particular. I'm prepared more to talk about the BECS program. Um, I know that our office is in touch with all of those parties about a number of bail initiatives, and I imagine that that one is included. Oh, so, so is there no one from Mock J who can talk about the bail assessment project? No? No. Okay. Um, do you have any thoughts or opinions on the recommendations or the suggestions for expanding BECS that were raised by um, uh, CJA today, in particular the issue of 
eliminating, I guess, the threshold requirements for 16 and 17 year olds? Yeah, it's definitely something that we're actively talking about um, and, uh, and are starting to implement. Okay. All right, well, um, the focus of our interest with MACJE is really with the Vera project. Um, so we would like to get information from MACJE in particular about what kind of um, dialoguing and training that um, has been done, uh, if you know, for judges when it comes to interacting with, with the Vera Bail Project and with using the alternative forms of, of bail uh, and what metrics you are examining and what conclusions, if any, you have reached or observations you've made. I, I don't want to say conclusions because the project is not even close to being uh, finished. Who, who at MACJ is responsible for the, the, the Vera project? is telling me that um, Miriam Popper is on the, on the programmatic side and Ermali, um, I think, is probably on the contract side. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So you heard the exchange with, um, I guess it was uh, Legal Aid, who said that um, when the writs are filed and Commissioner Brand is the, the defendant, it's not the Corporation Council that is appearing on the other side, it's, it's the respective district attorney's office. Do you know why that is so? Um, I'd have to defer to someone else in the administration to re re regarding those legal issues. Yeah, so why is it that CJA is the only um, entity that is allowed to place a hold uh, while someone, they track down someone who can help pay bail? Why, why can't a public defender do that or, or a, a bail fund? Um, I'm not sure. I think that's the, the court practice. I'm not sure if that's statutory. I, I just can't hear you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm not sure if that's statutory or court practice, but we can look into that. Okay. Anything else? Okay. All right. Thank you. That concludes our hearing. We are very, very happy to, to hear that the Vera Bail Project and, and that the expansion of BEX are contributing to mitigating the evils of, of cash bail. And uh, we hope that you think uh, hard about how you'd like to potentially scale the pilot if you think that it's necessary to get to a place where we can say this thing works and, and here's how we should bring it uh, citywide. Thank you all very much.